Thank you so much, Dr. Hashmi, for that presentation. Amazing. Um, so we're ready up to open up the Q&A session. So first, we want to explain to everyone how that, how that works. We normally don't take questions directly from the chat. Instead, we ask everyone to virtually raise their hand. Uh, if you're not sure how to do this, look at the bottom of your Zoom window. You'll see a reactions tab. Hit on that, and then you'll see a raise hand function. You click on that, and that, that will populate your, your hand on our participants window. Um, we take questions in order, in order in which we receive them. And when it's your turn, we'll unmute you and prompt you to ask your question. So we ask that everyone keep their questions brief and on topic. And in order to give everyone a chance to get their question answered, we won't be taking follow-up questions. So let's go ahead and get started. I do see a lot of questions now. Okay, first person we have is Rita. Rita, where are you from and what is your question? I am Rita Batija from Long Island, New York, and a very, very nice presentation, uh, uh, Dr. Hasimi. Uh, the two quick question, there is a fermented high protein soy uh, tofu. Is that okay to have along with the regular soya bean or it should be the organic soya bean because it's very difficult to get ready to eat you know, organic soya bean. So on that, and the second question is that you mentioned about the sugar. So how about little sugar and the monk fruit and manitol, which is a sugar alcohol, mm -hmm. would that be accepted? Thank you very much. That's my two quick questions. Great question. So the first question was regarding uh, fermented. So remember when, when we start to talk about fermented foods, the, the big thing that I would always point out is just be very careful about fermented foods in terms of the sodium content. So overall, big picture, looking at kidney disease, one of the biggest things we can do is cut back on the sodium. So fermented foods are awesome. If you're able to do that, that's great. There's some really fascinating data on fermented foods that I've talked about in the past, but definitely be very mindful of that in terms of the salt content. Now, in terms of your second question, as far as sort of sugar, alcohols, mannitol, et cetera, going on, you know, the, the challenge that we have is really what ends up happening to your gut microbiome. And there are so many specific changes. So we, we focus so much on brain health, but what we're finding is, is your gut is also a brain, except it's like those, um, those movies on TV where like there's that big villain with a gigantic brain. Well, your gut is like that big villain with a gigantic brain, except you can change it. So then all those bacteria, they work in synchrony and they work towards your favor. And this is where, you know, it's not to knock on the idea that you can't have stuff that you want once in a while, but we have become so addicted to the idea of sugar alcohols or non-nutritive sweeteners that this idea of having our natural taste buds. And where we get into trouble is, is when folks come to me and I ask them to go off of things like stevia, go off of monk fruit, and just be able to go back to fruit. And what I tell them is, we have some really well-designed studies that show within seven to 10 days, the taste buds on your tongue and your mouth actually change and they go back to where strawberries will actually start to taste sweeter again. So my, my recommendation is to try to focus on foods as close to their natural form as you can, number one. Number two is at the end of the day, it's not that stevia monk fruit are gonna be terrible for you. When used in moderation, they're great and nobody's perfect. I am absolutely furthest from perfect as you can get. But my advice is, is progress over perfection. And if you do that, you're going to do great. Life is way too short to spend trying to be perfect. Thank you, doctor. Next, we have David. David, where are you from and what is your question? Hi, thank you so much for taking my question. Uh, I'm from the Washington, D.C. area. And as far as monk fruit and stevia, I noticed it's in many, many supplements. And so I just wanted to make that as a comment. comment. It's very hard to avoid because of that. But my main concern and question relates to kidney stones as far as prevention and treatment. Um, you said in a previous um, presentation, the best way is to drink a lot of liquid, uh, water, or whatever. I heard also it, it's helpful to drink or take lemon juice. I don't know how you feel about that. As for treating it, I had a friend who had kidney stones and he used sound waves and that seemed to be effective. I don't know if that can be used in most cases, I guess it depends on the individual. 
And then finally, one of the other presenters is an herbalist. And I noticed on her website, she claims that this herb called Chanca Piedra, which is spelled C-H-A-N-C-A, C-H-A-N-C-A, second word is Piedra, P-I-E-D-R-A, helps to break up kidney and gallstones. I don't know if you have any thoughts or experience with that, but my main concerns and questions is preventing kidney stones. How do you treat kidney stones? How do you diagnose kidney stones? And if this herb, if you've heard of it and if you think it's helpful. Yeah, so thank you so much for the question. So in, in regards to kidney stones, first, there's many types of kidney stones. There are kidney stones that are present in more of an acidic type environment. Then there are kidney stones that are present in more of an alkaline type environment. And the reason we want to know is if it's present in more of an acidic type of environment, we're going to treat those different. We're going to be wanting to make the acidic environment less acidic. So in those cases, things like citrate would matter a lot. But if it's more of an alkaline type stone, for example, a calcium phosphate stone, that's going to be different because of the fact that it's more of an alkaline type environment and we need to treat differently. So let's go back to the basics. The basics is if you have a stone, how the heck does a stone form? A stone is nothing more than debris. Just little, imagine like you're, you're looking at a pond and you see, you know, you're standing on the side and there's some sand, those little tiny pieces of sand, they start to stick together, they harden, and now you have a stone. That's it. That's all it is. So if you have a stream, not a pond, a stream that's moving, it's very difficult, not impossible, but very difficult for those little tiny pieces of sand to find a way to stick together and stay. Most of the time, even if they get you know, a few of them sticking together, the stream keeps moving and they fall out. So not only do they have to stick together, they have to get stuck inside the stream. So the reason we recommend things like two to three liters of water, and we're asking for making at least two liters of urine a day, is because of the fact that by making that stream happen, you're going to prevent particles from sticking together. And by preventing particles from sticking together, you reduce the chances for forming stones. So every single type of stones, no matter what it is, drinking water is going to help. Then in terms of your second part, which was really around citrate, citrate is excellent because the majority of stones are in an acidic environment. That's why if you have a stone, your nephrologist will always tell you is catch the stone, catch the stone. We want to analyze the stone. We want to know what the heck kind of stone it is. Because if we can figure out what type of stone it is, we can go ahead and treat it. We also know if we don't figure out what type of stone, we'll treat it like one of the common stone that's found in 80% of the people, which is more acidic. So that's why we will give people citrate, citrate in the form of a supplement, either liquid or pills, or we'll tell you lemons and limes going on. And most of the time we say lemons and limes, and even sometimes, you know, there's some data that says oranges are fine. Other data that if you have um, declining kidney health, oranges may not be as good because vitamin C can convert into oxalate. So if you're predisposed to calcium oxalate stones, you may want to avoid oranges. But generally speaking, oranges, lemons and limes, I tell all my patients just lemons and limes in general. So lemons and limes are the ways to go in terms of lowering your risk for kidney stones. In terms of the Chanka Piedra question, you know, this has come up at least in my conversations in the past. The way that I practice medicine is I look for not one study, but I look for replication of studies as randomized clinical trials, because I need to make sure one is not the person who's you know, benefiting off the drug that they can show me that. So as soon as I have data on something, and if I know that the data is there to support it works, then that's something I want to tell my patients. It's the same thing that I want to go home and tell my kids or tell my wife or tell my own family members. Whatever I say, my first objective is, is to do no harm. And I want to be able to have some kind of information to back it. You had brought up the idea of sound waves. So there's shockwave lithotripsy. There's all sorts of other things. There's lasers that they can use. Your urologists are always coming up. Sometimes they used to even have to open up and do an incision to go in and take the kidney stones out. There's all sorts of ways, but none of those ways are, are good in the sense because you are doing a traumatic way of doing it. Those are things that we reserve when the nephrologist can't be helpful. And then in terms of knowing if you have kidney stones, first, if you have a kidney stones, kidney stones are like little tiny sharp blades. 
And so when they move around, they cut everything they touch and they cause the most intense pain. In fact, my female patients will tell me that have kidney stones, that that's the only thing that gets into comparison to childbirth. That's how severe kidney stone pain can be. So when people complain of pain in their kidneys and it's this really sharp pain, kidneys don't hurt by definition. They only hurt for a couple of reasons because you have an infection or you have a stone going on. So just keep that in mind as you're thinking about it. So as far as the bottom line on stone goes, water is in fact incredibly effective. Citrate, which means more alkaline type foods or plant-based foods, except for the couple of types of alkaline stones, but those are much more rare. For the majority of patients, it's plant-based diets, cutting down on protein because protein is acidic, right? Making sure you never hold your pee and you have the stream, not the pond effect going on. And just be careful about taking anything extra. Talk to your nephrologist or any other person you're talking to. Make sure that whatever you end up deciding to take, find the data on it. There's data nowadays on everything. It's not like before where we had a shortage of studies coming out. Now we have so many studies and never trust one study. Look for studies done by different people in different places. And if they say the same thing, now you can start to trust them. Are ultrasounds good to detect kidney stones? Yes, absolutely. So the way you end up looking for kidney stones is three different ways. A KUB, right, which is basically an x-ray kidney or the bladder. And an x-ray will once again pick up the majority of stones, except for ones that are not going to light up. That's very rare. But KUB is what we use. Ultrasound is another one we use. I like ultrasound simply because it's not radiation and I can look for other things. But an ultrasound is sound wave, so it's not as precise, but it will still give you an idea. So very small stones can be pissed, can be missed. And then the last one is, is a CTKUB or a CAT scan, which of course is far more radiation. And generally speaking, we'll reserve CAT scans on those really rare cases where we're worried that there might be an obstruction going on and we need to look at the whole anatomy because we need our urology colleagues to go in and sort of do a procedure going on. So that's where a CTKUB, which is going and looking basically from the kidneys all the way down to the bladder itself to see where the kidney stones might be.